Um, I am Corey Bowen. I'm the County Extension Agent for Agriculture in Wharton County. And uh, I'll give you a little intro on how we came up on this virtual field day. All the way back into March, when things were changing, we knew we couldn't hold on-site programs. Uh, we were hopeful all the way until June 1st. June 1st marked the date that um, we knew we could not hold the field day. Uh, agency restrictions after June 1st only allowed us to have meetings up of up to 10 people. So that we knew on June 1st, um, we will have to go the virtual route. So in that those months, March, April, May, uh, the agency created what we call initiative teams, initiative teams per commodity. Uh, and this is uh, an extension team of, of professionals in the extension system, mostly county extension agents who are given direction uh, just to continue the educational needs within the rice industry during this time, during COVID-19. So uh, we got, got together and we're having just one field day virtually instead of two this year. Um, and here we are, here we are at our virtual field day. We're gonna uh, kick off this morning with Dr. Ted Wilson. And uh, uh, he's there in Beaumont. Dr. Wilson is our director of the Texas A&M AgriLife Research and Extension Center in Beaumont. I'll remind our, our listeners that today's uh, virtual field day will be recorded. And um, uh, Dr. Wilson will tell you the site where everything uh, will be held, including uh, the research that he's going to introduce us to. So, uh, Again, to all of our 105 participants, thank you very much for taking time to be with us today. And uh, Dr. Wilson, take it from here. Thank you, Corey. I'm going to start a video. Uh, you'll control on your side of the computers the volume that you hear. So here goes. Welcome to the 2020 Virtual Rice Field Day. My name is Ted Wilson. I'm the Beaumont Eagle Lake Center Director. This field day includes video presentations on different aspects of rice production management. It addresses major issues that producers face when growing, managing, harvesting, storing, and marketing their crop. A special thanks to the Texas Rice Producers Board and the Texas Rice Research Foundation for funding much of the research presented in this first video. All of the Texas A&M AgriLife Extension agents organize this virtual field day and each of the speakers who prepared videos. Special thanks to Pat Carey for flying the UAV drone in the first video to highlight major aspects of rice research at the Beaumont Eagle Lake Center. And special thanks to Omar Samante for the considerable effort developing the video you're currently watching. During the first video, you will see a number of presentations on aspects of plant breeding, plant physiology, and agronomic insect, weed, and disease management. It is sometimes easy to forget the economic impact that research has had on rice production in Texas, for that matter, the entire United States. Four statistics summarize the impact the best. Since 1945, Rice shields have increased from an average of 1,600 pounds per acre to normally over 8,200 pounds per acre, representing a 513% increase during that period of time. With bit less than half of this increase due to the increases in varietal development, i.e. better varieties, and that more than half due to improvements in rice production and management. Rice grain quality has increased in relative terms by about 30% since the 1960s. Water use per acre of rice production has increased by about 35% when combined with the major increases in rice yields. This translates to the water use efficiency of rice production increasing by about 360% since the 1960s. Or simply put, 3.6 times as much rice grain is produced per gallon of water used today compared to 1960. Research continues to play an important role in ensuring the economic security of rice producers and the food security of our nation. But it is only because of our rice producers 
that this research has been made possible. The first video summarizes eight presentations. And I'm gonna summarize these very quickly, but please watch the videos for the details. The right brain presentation by Omar Samante, Darlene Sanchez and Jasper Puerto addressed brain yield and quality improvements to the inbred rice breeding project, release of a high yielding, high quality rice cultivar, which is named Trinity, the status of the hybrid rice breeding project, improvements in rice blast disease resistance by combining desirable genes using DNA marker assisted selection, and maximizing grain yield and improving grain quality in hybrid using DNA markers for wide genetic compatibility, allowing good genes to be incorporated for temperature sensitivity, smell sterility, and grain quality. This is followed by a presentation by Fugan Do addressing recent advances in rice nutrient management, then a presentation by Lee Tarpley and Abdul Mohammed, which addressed the impact of micronutrients on rice yield performance. Then a presentation by Mo Wei addresses pure cane aphids on sorghum, rice water weevil and stem borers on rice, and the status of three new insect pests that have made their way recently into the United States. Presentation by Shane Zhou and Shankar Gar, his graduate student, addresses rice, coral, smut, and fungal pathogens associated with seedling diseases, while a presentation by Muthu Bagapathanian and Shane Zhou addressed current research on weed management. The last presentation by Yubin Yang covers development a web-based application to predict seasonal development of different rice varieties and the management of insects that can otherwise cause major economic loss to stored rice following harvest. And then talks about the use of genetic models and UAV technologies to improve our understanding of how rice yields are impacted by climatic and biotic stresses. Each presentation summarizes this presentation can be downloaded from the Beaumont website by going to beaumont.tamu.edu and then selecting e-library, the second most right menu item, then run that runs left to right across the top of the screen, then selecting virtual field day, and then choosing which presentations you wish to download or view. In the next several days, we'll be working on moving these presentations to different websites including YouTube, to increase their availability and speed of access. Please stay safe, and we hope you have a successful 2020 production season. Thank you very much. For the highlights of the inbred rice feeding program, Trinity will be released as a new rice variety. It is a high-yielding, high-quality rice line. Compared to procedural, Trinity's grain yield is about 12% higher, while its chalky grain percentage is similar. In preparation for the varietal release of Trinity, 600 panicles that showed minimal grain size variation and high quality were selected and planted in a Pedro nursery to produce breeder seed. Excess elite lines are continuously being evaluated in new trials. 80 entries are being evaluated in the preliminary yield trials, 60 are in the statewide preliminary yield trial, and 49 are both in the advanced statewide yield trial and the multi-state uniform rice regional nursery trial. As part of this year's expansion in the inbred rice breeding program, the number of process that it will generate was increased from 25 to 100. Its pedigree nursery was enlarged from 3,100 to 4,200 rows. And the number of entries in its statewide preliminary yield trial was increased from 40 to 60. Furthermore, Texas elite lines in the preliminary yield trial and the statewide preliminary yield trial will undergo DNA marker assisted selection or blast resistance. Two elite lines with high grain yield and low chalk grain percentages, these are RU130-3181 
and RU 1803140 are in the breathing pipeline and are strictly being evaluated. Okay, good morning. Welcome to the field day of Texas A&M AgriLife Research at Beaumont. These are some of the uh, five key points or highlights of our project. Its most advanced cytoplasmic male sterile lines are in the fourth backcross generation and will be crossed with restorer lines to generate hybrids for evaluation in next year's preliminary yield trial. Its potential thermosensitive genetic male sterile lines or PGMS lines are in the third filial generation and are undergoing DNA markers assisted selection for the TGMS gene. Those selected will be harvested for seed and grain quality evaluation this year. It's evaluation of high quality inbred lines, which are in their fifth and sixth filial generations, are undergoing marker assisted selection for the possession of wide compatibility and restoring factor genes. Both of these are needed in making new restore lines for male parents to create high yielding hybrids when crossed with cytoplasmic male stem lines. Those without the restoring factor genes have the potential for use as new maintainer lines. Also, grain quality is a major selection criterion and advanced inbred lines are being screened for low chocolate grain percentages, long grain type, and intermediate amylose concentration using digital image and near infrared grain analyzers. The heterotic group approach to breed for high grain yield is being verified in a yield trial study this year. Grain yields of hybrids produced by narrow process, for example, parents that belong to the Japonica subspecies of rice, are being compared against those produced by white process. These are parents belonging to different heterotic groups, for example, a Japonica crossed with an Indica rice. The group of hybrids produced from white process showed higher grain yield and tiller density in last year's yield trial. The objectives of the hybrid rice breeding program are to develop hybrid varieties and parental lines with high and stable grain yield and improved grain quality. The marker assisted selection laboratory of the hybrid rice breeding program started to become fully functional in 2020 which will help increase efficiency in achieving its breeding objectives. Identification and use of wide compatible parental lines will produce intersubspecific or Indica by Japonica hybrids with normal seed set and increased levels of hybrid vigor. The use of thermosensitive genic male sterility or TGMS system will potentially increase the options for heterotic combinations in hybrid rice. In order to improve the competitiveness of U.S. rice in the international market, we are using marker-assisted selection to screen for grain quality genes in legacy rice varieties from countries where the U.S. exports and imports rice. Here in our hybrid rice breeding group, we are working on improvement of blast resistance by pyramiding genes using DNA marker assisted selection. Use of resistant cultivars offer a long term control for blast disease, but the fungi causing blast has multiple strains and it evolves more rapidly than the cultivar. Thus, there is need for releasing cultivars with more durable and for other range of persistence to different blast strains. The objective of this study is to develop a blast resistance screening pipeline for our breeding program using marker assisted selection. We aim to determine the presence of multiple known blast resistance genes, aka PI genes, pyramided within developed test lines that will be evaluated for efficacy of resistance to blast disease. This marker-assisted selection screening pipeline is being applied to improve our breeding efficiency by selecting rice lines that exhibit positive blast resistance DNA markers and eliminating those without it. This screening will allow us to focus on improving the test lines with multiple positive blast resistance markers. 
Welcome to Palma and Eagle Lake Beauty. In 2020, we have two major field trials conducted at both Palma Research Center and Eagle Lake Station. The first one is our bridal assessment. We pretty much focus on newly released and popular varieties in test to look at their performance and both Boma Scent and Eagle Lake Station. The second one is our nitrogen measurement, specifically our nitrogen applied before permanent flooding and suffer uh, optimal soil conditions like wet soil or soil quality and determine what is the best nitrogen measurement strategy as well as to evaluate nitrogen loss associated with ammonia fertilization. Thank you. Doctors Tarkley and Mohammed of the Plant Physiology Project have been working with data and biosciences to test a potential plant growth regulator that's applied in early grain filling to promote grain filling and thus grain yield and quality. As part of the project, an unfarmed trial was coordinated with Randy Walagura. There was a rain interruption of harvest, but the producer estimated the damage of the higher PGR rate was 400 pounds per acre. In 2019, doctors Tarpley Muhammad initiated a study with Sample Industries and LC Fertilizers to test a number of micronutrient fertilizer blends that are applied over the top. In this first year of the study, a copper, phosphorus, sulfur mix stood out as providing a yield increase over the adjuvant-only control of about 900, 900 pounds per acre. Howdy, y'all. Uh, welcome to our virtual field day. And I wanted to, uh, this is Mo Wei. I'm the entomologist. I've been here for 38 years. Uh, this is basically my last field season. but. I did want to give you a few uh, bullet points on the research that we're doing this year. Uh, first of all, we're determining uh, yield losses due to stem borers in Presidio and a hybrid uh, in a planting date study. Second, uh, we're evaluating a novel insecticide called Prevathon. It has the same active ingredient as Dermacor X100, the seed treatment, and we're looking for uh, rice water weevil control with this product, as well as stem borer control. Uh, third, uh, we're, we are monitoring the Texas rice, bowl, uh, rice belt for the exotic uh, rice plant hopper, rice delf acid, which is native to South America and Central America. And we found uh, populations here attacking ratoon rice in Texas uh, in uh, the last several years, beginning in 2015. And uh, fourth, uh, with help from our crop consultants, uh, we are monitoring uh, the Texas rice belt for two exotic species of rice stink bugs. We have a native species. Uh, the scientific name is Evilus pugnax. And uh, there are two other species that are exotic uh, that were found in Florida, uh, attacking rice in Florida. So we're seeing if, if we may have those two species here in in uh, Texas. And uh, that's about it. And I just want to thank you for uh, your support over the years. And if you have any questions, feel free to contact me. Thank you. Rice Plant Pathology Project is conducting 21 field trials on variety resistance screening, fungicide efficacy evaluation, and beneficial indoor seed treatment at the Beaumont and Eagle Lake sites in 2020 to evaluate and develop resistant rice varieties and effective fungicide for control of rice diseases important in Texas. A success of rice disease control is dependent on three key management practices. Selecting a resistant or partial resistant variety, 
using effective fungicides and apply fungicide at the right time. Rice kernel smart continued its a severe occurrence in Texas in 2019. Amistad talk is the most effective for control of kernel smart follow the proper chromosome containing fungicides such as the TILT based on the results of field trials conducted in Texas. And it's the top, the only fungicide that has been labeled for use in the Latone crop is effective control of circles water when applied on the Latone crop. Update of three fungicides. New fungicide X carrier of valent for control of rice sprout is expected to receive the label for rice in 2020 and to be available in 2021. New fungicide and top of Syngenta, labeled in 2018, provides excellent control of curtain smart and good control of sheath blood, blast, and succulent spoiler. Stratego of beer, which has been used to provide excellent control of rice blast and good control of other diseases, will discontinue the labor for rice. Hi everyone, welcome to the virtual field day at Texas a and Life Research Center at Beaumont. I'm Shankar Gaire, and I'm going to discuss about fungal pathogen associated with rice seedling disease. Seedling blight, that is caused by several seedborne and soilborne pathogens, is one of the important seedling diseases in dry seeded rice. Such disease symptoms include pre- and post-emergent damping up, resulting thin or irregular plant distance. We did a survey in 2018 from 19 crop fields of Texas to identify fungal pathogens associated with this disease. What we found is that Rhizochronia solani, AZ11 and AZ4, Fusarium species, and Escrocium rhodopsi are the pathogens that fungal pathogen that causes seedling blight in Texas. Among these fungal pathogens, Rhizochronia solani, AZ11 is a dominant species, and Rhizochronia solani, AZ4 is a new fungal pathogen that causes seedling blight in rice. For the management of this disease, Texas farmers should target on that, this pathogen using the fungicidal seed treatment. Thank you. This summer, we have field experiments with four industry cooperators at the Eagle Lake Rice Research Station. Cotiva. We have two experiments with Cotiva this year. In the first one, we are testing tang mix or premix combinations of loyant with clincher. In the second Cotiva sponsored experiment, we are testing loyant as part of a broader herbicide program where loyant is placed as a pre-flood application. Adama, we are evaluating prefix, which is imazithapyr, and postscript, which is imazamox, herbicides for weed control in the rice stakes full page rice production system. UPL, in this experiment with UPL, we are testing different formulations of proponel for weed control and rice injury. Sipcam Avan. Here we are evaluating a generic formulation of chromosome. The commercial name is Caravan, and compare it with command. Rice development advisory is a web-based application that can predict rice growth stages and then make species specific margin recommendations. Post harvest grain management is also a web based application that can assess the control of grain moisture, grain temperature, and the rice test in storage beam using aeration control. Drone technology has the potential to provide a fast field testing and the crop status monitoring. GM model assistant program has the potential to extend the rice breeding for higher yield rice through performance evaluation and early elimination of poor performing genotypes.
Thanks for being with us today, Dr. Outlaw. Thank you. I, I, I wish under the circumstances, you know, when you start talking about policy, uh, sometimes it's a good thing, sometimes it's a bad thing. I, I don't know. Today's presentation is going to leave anybody feeling uplifted um, because I am going to talk quite a bit about economics and where we're at. But I uh, appreciate the opportunity to visit with you guys, uh, at least virtually. Uh, Washington has been really busy, and that, that, that's saying something uh, more than normal. Uh, you know, when, when all this COVID-19 stuff started happening, uh, they, they acted actually very quickly to pass uh, uh, some stuff back in March, uh, two different, well, three things in March, basically. Uh, first off, you know, they, they wanted to get some stimulus money out there for, for uh, taxpayers and uh, then they uh, put out the paycheck, pr paycheck protection program and that, that was something that hopefully all of you that, that, that were eligible uh, participated in. Um, and then the phase three was the part that uh, uh, really had to act, that it was the CFAP portion uh, announced on May 19th, and, and that, was the, that was the portion that actually had some relief for ag producers. Uh, for most of the, the uh, uh, rice producers, obviously, you know that CFAP didn't, didn't protect rice, and uh, it had to do with the fact that the, the, local, the actual market prices during the time they measured from January to April basically, uh, basically didn't go down, and so they didn't, there wasn't any protection for rice. There was, for a number of other crops, uh, uh, just a wide variety of things. Those, many of you also have a few cows and you know that those cows were protected as well. Uh, I will say at this point that is, and, and Bart can correct me, uh, you know, one of the things that we probably haven't, we haven't seen you together, but, but with Bart moving from the House Ag Committee back to Texas A&M to be the co-director with me, uh, we, ha we have a pretty good one-two punch. I think he's probably one now and I'm just two, but that's, that's fine. Uh, but we have a really good one-two punch in dealing with Washington. And uh, it is our opinion that, uh, you know, there's going to be some more assistance happening. Um, the reason being is that with prices falling off the way they have on the crop side, and they re they've rebounded a little bit for, say, corn and beans because of the crop report. But uh, it when you start looking at how much money is going to be spent on ARC and PLC, uh, this fall, which was for last year's crop, it's, it's going to be substantial, but for the current crop, the, tw the 2020 crop uh, that you're yet to harvest, uh, we expect there to be quite a bit of assistance. Just remember, CFAP was basically providing a census, assistance on unmarketed uh, 2019 crop. So many of you had already sold your rice and so you wouldn't have gotten any protection, even if it had triggered on a low price. Well, uh, so, so you all know, we, we do this a lot, but you know that we use, we work with producers around the country, uh, the rice belt, and collect costs and uh, develop descriptions of those farms we call representative farms. But uh, the, the primary input into that is so the price projections, both for inputs and the, and output rice prices that we get from uh, FAPRI at the University of Missouri. And so we were back in uh, January when the phase one deal was, was being completed and it, before all this COVID-19 stuff was really rampant here in the U.S., um, it looked like that uh, rice prices were going to rebound, and, and the blue line there says that they're going to be much higher than than uh, what the current projections are. Um, unfortunately, for most of the last four or five years, the season average price, which is the one that triggers commodity payments, the season average price has basically been in this range. Um, so some of you would say, "Well, it doesn't really matter." The the PLC reference price is $14, so we're going to get the difference. Uh, when you get uh, prices declining by a dollar or a hundred weight, many of you are going to get hit, get hit by payment limitations, and you're not going to get the full difference. And just remember, I have to do this every time with, with uh, meetings, but 
in no situation are you better off with government help than, than if you would have gotten a better price for the market. Uh, there's lots of reasons for that, but those payment calculations are only on 85% of base acres. And, and uh, so they're, you're starting from uh, a loss to begin with. When you, start, when you start getting help from the government, you're already in a loss position. It's just how, how big a loss is it gonna be? So long grain prices, which are basically for Texas, are gonna be off. Uh, the California prices are also gonna be off. And then medium short grain, which I, I don't know, we have a little bit in Texas, but I know Arkansas primarily is, is gonna fall off by more than a dollar. So with that kind of backdrop, we were, we were looking at this. And again, here's where we have representative farms. So we meet with four to six producers uh, around in each of these areas. So like, for example, in California, we have four farms out there. Uh, we've got four farms in Texas. We've got certain places where there's just one, but in uh, Eagle Lake, we have two, uh, two farms, I believe. And then multiple things in, in uh, Arkansas, Mississippi, uh, Louisiana, and Missouri. So when you start looking at this, uh, we've been dealing with Congress so much. I've been doing it for 30 some odd years, 33 or 34 now. And we have, we have to boil things down because people's, uh, they really need things concise. And so what we've done is we did a lot of modeling and there's a lot of economics that goes on, but the picture I'm going to show you is just kind of a snapshot. And, and basically it blends the middle column, which is ending cash. It's a probability that, you know, you're just not going to make money coming in. It's going to be less than money going out. And so you'd have to re get refinanced. And, and that's, that is one measure on the far right hand side, uh, probability of a net worth decline. That means that your equity and your operation would go down. And when we ran this back in January, obviously land values have held very firm and, and, and that's one of the long -term, term success stories in American agriculture is the land values have basically gone up and up. Uh, even before Dick Otis was born, this was, uh, this was a long time thing going on. And so that is a good thing. I heard that. Yeah, I, I knew I saw you on your screen, so I thought I'd kind of make sure you're awake. Uh, the deal is this: equity. Uh, if you're not losing equity, you're at least you're holding holding your own. But you do need the cash flow, so you so you have uh, uh, money to start the next year, and you don't get too far behind. And the middle column is the one where there's a little bit of red spread out across the country, and that red means that that there's not a very good chance of actually cash flowing. When you put those two measures together, we our overall ranking said, you know what? And this is one of the better rice projections we've had in a, in a long time uh, early in the year was when you put those two measures together, you go, you know what? By 2025, if prices don't turn around more than they have here, um, uh, there are gonna be some folks that get hurt, but, but by and large, uh, the farms would look better, better than we've seen in quite some time. Now, if you put the new prices in that I showed you from June, uh, you have a lot of farms not cash flowing, which is the red and the yellow, with, the, with a higher probability of not cash flowing red and a less of a probability not cash flowing yellow. And that spills over into losing wealth. So you see that it, it has an impact. And, and when that happens, uh, you know, the farms are, are, are very severely damaged. So, uh, when people ask me if I think there's going to be a phase four or more help than would have been otherwise for our normal programs, just remember I'm not bad mouthing. I'm not running down ARC and PLC for our program crops that were done in the last farm bill. And Bart can mention this as well, that the last farm bill was a no net increase in funding farm bill. So they took the money they had and they did the best they could with it. All I'm saying here is this picture tells me that you guys are going to be, and, and the picture looks similar for other crops as well, that there's gonna to have to be some additional help. That's why we feel very strongly that there's gonna be a phase four set of help. And that's, that's the question for you is, how do you want that help? Uh, I pose it to everyone to say, well, you know, ARC and PLC are, are the two safety net programs combined in the farm bill. You know, because of the trade losses, we had MFP1 and MFP2. And I think from a rice perspective, MFP2, uh, uh, you, would be, you, would, 
you would probably say, if I'm going to get help on this, I'd, I'd really like to get it something similar to MFB2. Uh, I can tell you that, that Bart and I have been working with uh, folks in Washington uh, trying to figure out different ways that they can do this. Obviously, the, the chief economist's office reaches out to us as well. And that's who actually designs those programs. And so uh, we're trying to help do the best we can. I, there's, there's always limited money, but it, the main thing is trying to get as much m money in the hands of producers. But this picture right here, if, if people understand it, it, it is really a tough picture going forward. Um, I only put this picture up to say that we did an we did an early assessment back on April 17th of what the impact of of uh, this could be on Texas production. Um, obviously, we were making huge guesses because we did not not much was known uh, at that time. We said that losses could could be in the six to eight billion range just for Texas. When you look at all the commodities we have, um, I would say that that. A few things have happened where we probably wouldn't be that pessimistic right now, but the losses are still going to be uh, sizable. And I bring this to, to uh, the point here is that uh, uh, we are updating this report right here. And next week, we will be coming out with a new version. And uh, I, I only bring this up to if you want to have this report sent to you, we've, we're instituting a new as soon as we finish it, we hit go and it sends it to you. So if you want to get our report, uh, that's going to have Texas, but it's also going to have a lot more national impacts as well. Uh, if you want that report, just send an email to my email at the in, end of this presentation and I will get you on the list. I will tell you this, uh, LG Ron is number one on my list and, and Linda Ron is number two on the list to get that. Um, they won't share, so I have to send it to them separately. So. Um, well, with, with regard to kind of trying to finish up, um, as we start looking at what's really going to be the impacts of uh, the losses, because the, the rice price at harvest is going to be low, and, and rice, more than most of the other crops in Texas, y'all store, either have on-farm storage or you, or you have commercial. Um, and I started looking at this early this week, just trying to figure out if the market signal signaling that storage might be a really good option or not. So this is a daily close for the few, what we call a forward curve. And the, and the people that do this for a living say, you know, if the, as we go out in each individual futures contract month, uh, if, if, if that price is moving up, then it's an indication that the market's saying you should store uh, to take advantage of that. So here's corn and it kind of looks like you expect it to look. Uh, the rough rice futures contract, obviously that 1642 is everything to do with COVID. So if you even, but if you just get, it, get that out of your mind, you look at it and, and it doesn't appear to be at this point. And again, I want to say this more because I'm not uh, completely naive. The, the rough rice futures volume is, is, not very significant when you start looking at it compared to other commodities. But at least the market participants that are playing right now are saying that there is some benefit to storage, but it's not quite as much as you hope it would. Because when you start looking at y'all are going to be harvesting into some pretty low prices, what are you going to do with the crop? It's very normal for you guys to store for a while anyway. But uh, uh, it's just one of those things where uh, it would be nice if there was a big upward upward movement of the uh, of the chart. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to finish and hopefully Corey maybe there's a question or two. Uh, again, if you want to get on our publication list, you just shoot me an email and we'll get you on there. And uh, I think we're going to Bart and I were talking about it. If you ask me something about the paycheck paycheck protection program and why it didn't work for you, I'm going to punt that one to him faster than you can possibly imagine because uh, he was the expert on that as we were going through. But if you want to know what, about thoughts on rice or rice policy, I'd be glad to glad to fill in there. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. So if you want to get my email, if you want to get on our list, you need to get that done. Uh, and then uh, we'll be glad to uh, to work with you, get you on the list. All right, All right Corey. Well, thanks uh, for the invitation thanks. to join you this morning. It's uh, great to be here with. Uh, with all of you, even if it is virtually. 
uh, this is probably the point in the presentation where if we were meeting in person, I would uh, ask for a show of hands for who the heck has ever heard of the, the generalized system of preferences. Uh, not something you talk about uh, every day. I think Joe should be should be grateful that I drew the GSP straw and he drew the farm policy straw this morning, but uh, is a, a, an obscure policy, but it's an important one. And so over you know, the next 15 minutes or so, we'll do a quick dive into uh, into GSP. We'll spend the first, uh, really the first half of the presentation talking about what it really is and what it does. And then the second half, you know, looking at it applied uh, directly to Rice. And then of course, happy to take any questions. So, but again, uh, thanks for, for having me this, this morning. Uh, just in terms of overview, you know, I, I kind of uh, couched it here on the first couple of slides in a series of questions just to talk through what it actually does. So what is GSP? Uh, it's really a trade preference program. So uh, it's a program that provides non-reciprocal duty-free uh, treatment for certain U.S. imports from certain developing countries. Uh, it's the oldest and the largest trade preference program we have in place. You may have heard of some of the other ones, uh, you know, that are more regional in nature, like uh, AGOA, the African Growth and Opportunity Act. Uh, it's another popular trade pre preference program. But the idea behind it uh, is it, uh, that it does grant duty-free access uh, to certain imports from certain countries with a focus on developing countries. You know, so why in the world do we go about doing this? Uh, you know, for all of you who've been following what's happened on trade over the last several years. Uh, and so, you know, why, why in the world are we doing this? Uh, why do we even have GSP? Uh, and really it, uh, it goes back, uh, you know, 45 years. Uh, and it was the, the primary purpose of it is really to spur economic development uh, in poor countries through trade. So the idea being that if you are a developing country and particularly the least developed country, we're gonna give you preferential access uh, and so that you can expand your economy through trade. Uh, you know, there was a debate way back in the day about how this was structured and instead of deciding to do kind of a unified uh, system uh, through the WTO, they really left it up to the developed countries to create their own. Uh, it is, you know, based on a shared set of principles, but it's really up to those individual countries to do it. And the United States is not the only country that, that does. Uh, you know, I mentioned that it had been around for about 45 years. Uh, it was created in Title V of the 74 Trade Act, uh, went into, into to force early in, in 75, and Congress has reauthorized it, uh, you know, 14 different times. Uh, it's not there on the last bullet, but uh, the, the current round of authorization, and they usually last two, three years, uh, often they'll expire and Congress will pick it up retroactively in the, in the reauthorization. But the current one uh, runs through the uh, December uh, of this year. And for those of you who uh, were, gl were glued to the television watching Ambassador Lighthizer testify here recently, he was asked about GSP uh, reauthorization and, and was somewhat non-committal non uh, on reauth. And so uh, we're going to be talking about you know, the prospect of removing rice from GSP benefits, uh, but you know, Ambassador Lighthizer uh, did kind of leave the door open, uh, you know, to letting GSP be lapsed. I have you know no opinion one way or the other on whether that or happened or not. I just did find that uh, inter interesting. Uh, you know, second screen here, then you know, delving in a little deeper into what countries then are actually eligible for this. So, if the whole purpose of this program is to grant duty, you know, duty free access, who gets that? Uh, and so there are 119 uh, developing countries and territories that are that are designated as beneficiary developing company countries or BDCs, and these are the countries that that are eligible. Uh, these are really designated by the president, uh, and he does have a lot of discretion. But the criteria for designating a country as a BDC is really written down in statute. It's right in the U.S. Code, uh, and and it's a laundry list if you want to look look it up, there's a litany of things that, that qualify, but a lot of it has to do with that country's uh, yeah, economy, the status of its economy, and then also just kind of how it operates in, in, in the world. And so uh, as long as it's not uh, too egregious, uh, the, then it generally would qualify and would be listed. And so there are 119. Uh, within that grouping, then there are 44 of those countries that are also then designated as what are called least developed BDCs or LDBDCs. Uh, and those are the ones with the least developed uh, economies naturally. Uh, why that matters is uh, you have, you've really got to get into the product eligibility list to see why it matters. 
before I do that, though, you know, one line here in the middle of the screen that you'll see time and again, and it may be the most important part of all of this discussion we have this morning, uh, is that import sensitive uh, products are specifically prohibited from GSP treatment. Uh, the rice industry, probably more than anyone, uh, has been on the receiving end uh, of that phrase uh, time and time and time again, you know, from all my years on the Hill, uh, serving as the trade advisor to the chairman. Uh, I can't, uh, I can't uh, count up the number of times when we were being briefed on the status of trade negotiations around the world, we would ask, well, what's the status on rice? Well, it's import sensitive. And so, you know, it, it's that that is kind of been used as the just it, not kind of it has been used as the justification for not for for US rice being locked out of a lot of the rest of the world. And so uh, import sensitive products you know, are prohibited from GSP uh, treatment, which I think raises the question then of, well, then why is rice on the list here in the US? Um, beyond that, though, the program, it currently covers 3,500 imported products for BDC. So the biggest universe of products applies to BDCs. If you look in the you know, harmonized tariff schedule, you'll see a designation there for A. Those are the products uh, with GSP uh, benefits for BDCs. There's a, a subset then, um, a subset of those countries, the L LDBDCs uh, get additional duty-free access on, on an additional 1,500 products. And if you look in the HTS uh, list of products, those are denoted as A+. Uh, I know that's in the weeds, but it'll matter for a slide coming up here in a second. Uh, so that can countries or products become ineligible? You know, absolutely. Uh, the president does have a lot of flexibility in administering GSP. Uh, USTR, primarily through their role as chairing the Trade Policy Staff Committee, uh, conducts the annual reviews. They administer the program, conduct the annual reviews for both products and countries, and they make recommendations to the to the president. I, ITC also weighs in, uh, which we'll see. You know, they're doing that right now. Uh, on, on this project with rice. Uh, so just to wrap up the overview, uh, if you look at how those 119 are spread across the world, a lot in South America, Africa, and then Central and Southeast Asia, mentioned that it is possible for countries to come off. Uh, in 2019, both Turkey and India uh, were removed. Turkey was more of an economic decision, you know, and argue, arguing that their economy had advanced enough to, to come off the list. India uh, was primarily because uh, of lack of market access that they were granting to the United States was the primary justification that uh, the president used for pulling uh, India from, from GSP, uh, which is a big deal given that uh, they are a, a big exporter uh, even to the, U to the US. Uh, so if we drill down a little bit then or turn the page and look more specifically at rice, this is more just a general picture. This isn't GSP uh, specific here, but to set the stage, if you look over the last 10 years, uh, you know, exports, uh, you know, they've bounced around. You might, you know, identify a, a slight uh, decline, uh, declining trend, but largely they've kind of hovered in this same, this same region. Uh, imports, though, over time, generally the opposite trend. Uh, you know, if you look again, 2010 compared to 2019, 10, 10 years later, almost doubled uh, the amount that we're importing uh, into the United States. We're now, you know, U.S. domestic, in terms of domestic consumption here, you know, up to 20% of that. Uh, is being made up uh, of imports. And so naturally it's caused our trade, trade balance uh, to decline over time. Uh, I think it's probably even more sensitivity to that again, given the fact that we have such a tough time uh, negotiating access for US rice uh, in other parts uh, of the world. You know, coupled with the fact that uh, most other countries uh, you know, are subsidizing their producers in a way that we uh, you know, believe uh, runs afoul of the WTO commitments. Uh, if we drill down just a little bit further then uh, and look at the top 10 uh, import origins, uh, countries exporting to the United States, if we look at that by GSP uh, classification, uh, the, the blue are those countries, the, the GSP uh, eligible countries, uh, orange is uh, India, and then the gray is the, uh, the, the countries in the top 10 that are, that are non-GSP. And so in this blue, you're talking about countries like Thailand, Pakistan, Brazil, Vietnam, and Argentina. Uh, India would have been in it had they not fallen out here uh, last year. But taken together, they make up, you know, 95% or, or more of what, what we're importing. Uh, I do think though, you know, in this conversation, it's important to note that just because they are making up uh, the lion's share uh, of what we, 
are importing and that the vast majority of rice imports are from GSP eligible countries, it doesn't mean that everything's being imported or brought in through duty-free access via GSP. And so I think that's a very important distinguish uh, point to, to make, not to oversell what's going on here because you know, not all the, I mean, it's actually a quite, quite a small, uh, a quite small amount that's coming in under GSP, uh, which is the point of that last bullet, you know, 90% of the rice un imported under GSP is under this one uh, tariff code on par parboiled rice, uh, which makes up, you know, a very small over uh, overall share of rice imports. And so, uh, you know, these countries that have uh, preferential access under GSP are importing, but they're only using GSP for a very, very small share. So you ask, well, then why are we even looking at GSP and removing rice? We'll talk about that a little bit more in a little bit when we wrap up, uh, primarily because I think they're, you know, this isn't necessarily all about, uh, you know, that, that access. It's about other things that come along, along with it. So if you look then at just uh, at, at product eligibility across uh, the various whole kernel and broken uh, tariff codes. And, you know, and the six here uh, represent virtually everything other than flour and, you know, a few other things. Uh, if you look on the list over on the right-hand column here on GSP eligibility, you know, if you go back to that last slide, I mentioned, you know, that, uh, you know, most of what we're bringing in under, under GSP is parboiled. Uh, and you'll see here why. It's because uh, for all of the other tariff lines, it's really only the least developed countries that have access through GSP uh, for those products. But uh, on, on, on 3010, on parboiled, uh, the, the BDCs also have access, access there. And so this is the only thing that countries like you know, Brazil, Pakistan, Thailand, this is the only thing that they can, can export to the United States under, under uh, GSP. And 3019 makes up the, the lion's share of what we actually import. And so in the grand scheme, we're not talking about a lot of volume uh, or dollar value, uh, but again, we'll get to kind of to some of the other related items. And so if you get then to the 2020 GSP annual review, this process that USTR and ITC go through uh, looking at both products and countries, uh, USA Rice uh, put together the petition uh, to, to remove, and they, the, the request was to remove all of the tariff lines uh, for, for rice, for, for whole kernel and broken rice. And so uh, USA Rice led that petition. Uh, they were supported by, you know, a lot of the state uh, farm bureaus, the state rice organizations, USRPA, I know, uh, was supportive of, of, of the petition as well. And Dr. Wynn's up uh, next here and may want to comment on that as well. But I know USRPA uh, uh, was supportive of this. Uh, and so when you look at the, the petition that USA Rice uh, put together, kind of the, the summary of their petition uh, is that, you know, imports now make up 20% of U.S. domestic uh, consumption, 34 of the total import origins, you know, and that's for folks, uh, you know, exporting to the U.S. since 2016, uh, 34 of those are GSP eligible, uh, if you include India in the list, and that the top six account for you know as much as 99% of annual imports into the United States. Uh, beyond those price benefits, and this gets to the crux of when I mentioned there's other motivating factors here beyond these price benefits, because again, it's a small amount. But you know when you take that in combination with the fact that many of the top exporters are heavily subsidizing the rice production, uh, you know often in in excess of the WTO limits. Uh, it starts to paint a picture, you know, of double dipping, where we're giving privileged access at the same time that they are, or preferential access at the same time that they're subsidizing their own producers. And this, you know, whether you're talking about patty pledging in, in Thailand, or you're talking about pep and pepro in Brazil, or you're talking uh, about a whole litany of things that India is doing, uh, whether it's an enormous uh, import tariffs or, or, or import or input subsidies, uh, you know, on seed and on, uh, on irrigation, uh, or whether it's huge minimum support prices they're imposing, you take those together and, uh, and it has a significant uh, effect. I think the other element, you know, that USA Rice argued is that even, you know, without this access, they're most, in most cases, just pushed to most favored nation duties. And so on parboiled as the example, you're looking at 11.2 uh, percent uh, tariff in that case. And it might help make U.S. grown rice a little more competitive, putting it somewhat more on an even uh, even playing field, but still they're going to import. And I think what we're seeing with India right now bears that out. Uh, 
probably the most important thing of all of it though is the last item on the list and that is that removing GSP benefits uh, would acknowledge that U.S. grown rice is import sensitive. Again, you know, there are obvious price benefits, uh, but this one, the signal that this send, sends is probably most important, particularly as it comes to, you know, when our negotiators are sitting, trade negotiators are sitting at uh, the negotiating table working with other countries who constantly throw in their face the fact that rice is an import sensitive crop. Well, guess what? Uh, it's pretty sensitive here in our country too. Uh, we, you know, I don't need to tell you listening in on this that, uh, you know, we've grown rice in this country for, you know, probably 400, 400 years dating back to the 1600s and we've got multiple generation uh, operations here too. And so, um, you know, I think this is probably uh, one of the, the more important uh, uh, factors that come along with having rice removed from, from GSP benefits. Uh, so where do we go from here? Uh, well, we're still in the middle of the process, or industry, I should say, is still in the middle of the process. Uh, you know, they had the, I know USA Rice uh, at least particip participated and perhaps others did, but uh, I'd seen comments that uh, uh, from the, the hearing here recently with ITC. And so at this point, uh, there's uh, primarily responding to questions from USTR before they rule. Uh, that happened as, uh, as recently as, as last week or week before last. So all of this is happening you know, right now it's a very current, uh, current issue. You know, I think USTR has reached out to a few other uh, industry folks for questions and that uh, I think are, are still waiting on some input there. Uh, but the process is still is, is very much uh, uh, underway and a lot of it now is behind, behind, uh, behind the industry. And so uh, I think just to wrap up here, you know, even if products are removed from GSP, I mentioned this, exporters can still ship to the United States, you know, albeit a slightly higher tariff rate. You know, I did uh, on the previous slide mention India, but you know, despite losing GSP eligibility, you know, India, if you look at the first uh, five months of this year compared to, so January to May of this year compared to Jan January to May of last year, you know, they're still very much where they were, you know, kind of right on point with last year. And so, you know, these, uh, while, while slightly higher, they're not uh, import prohibitive. We're still bringing product into the United States. And so it's not about, you know, it's not about you know, shutting out, uh, you know, imports, you know, that's done at the, you know, those levels are really uh, ideally negotiated at the negotiating table. But again, you know, we've been, uh, uh, you know, the U.S. has been uh, kind of behind the eight ball for really for primary two reasons. And it's the last two here on the screen is that, you know, again, we constantly fight, you know, over the fact that, you know, rice is an import sensitive, import sensitive crop to other parts of the world. And so removing GSP benefits would send that signal that it's import sensitive here as well. Uh, and, you know, the other is I think removing GSP benefits, you know, it would signal uh, U.S. frustration. Maybe that's not the right word, but it's a way to characterize it here is that, you know, it would, it would signal that we're paying attention or that there is frustration, you know, with the fact that competitors are double dipping in GSP you know, while at the same time maintaining trade to sporting uh, policies that are negative, negatively impacting producers here at home. And so uh, I suspect in the last however many minutes we've been on, you may have heard more about GSP than you have in your entire life. But um, it is an interesting, it is an interesting topic. Uh, I do think it does have a bearing on our effectiveness in negotiating trade, trade agreements, uh, you know, and particularly if you're, you know, if you uh, operate in parboiled rice, you're uh, you know, it is a little bit more acute for you as well. So I don't want to dismiss that either, but uh, uh, it's an interesting topic. And at this point, uh, we'll, we'll see uh, where USTR goes. So uh, with that, happy to, uh, happy to take your questions if you want. Like Joe said, uh, if you want to get on the list, email him. If you have other questions or if you can email me too, but uh, particularly if you have questions, always happy to visit. And they, our number and the email are right there on the screen if, if we can do anything to help. So with that, thanks and happy to take your questions. Again, we're doing the uh, kind of a market update and outlook. And the, the first several slides, I know Dr. Outlaw and uh, Dr. Fisher have covered a little bit. I'm gonna touch on them slightly differently. Um, anytime we're talking about international trade or the rice market, uh, we have to look overseas because we are an export driven industry. Uh, and China's the big boy in the room. That uh, goes without, without a doubt. The um, politics seems to be dominating right now, uh, as, as again, Dr. Outlaw and Fisher 
commented on. Um, we don't really know a lot about phase one implementation, but the coronavirus has impacted that dramatically. Uh, it has slowed down, uh, stopped, depending on which adjective you want to use uh, for arguably good reasons. And But at the same time, uh, as an agricultural-based industry, rice, to a certain extent as well, we need to get this going uh, to get our pricing back on where it needs to be. There's been some uh, territorial disputes. I know some folks have seen that in the news. That's it, that has heightened the tensions uh, regarding some of these trade policies. And so it's important to keep the politics and the, uh, the, the lens, I guess, in the back of our minds whenever we talk about China. The actual demand and supply side factors over there have changed dramatically over the last six to eight months, especially. Um, they had a swine flu come through that caused them to liquidate a large, very large percentage of their pork herd. Um, that has impacted the purchasing requirements for China. It's actually taken a lot of the heat off and the, the mandatory need to purchase. So it gave them a little bit more latitude on timing. Um, the supply side, China has always been very uh, astute at working cross-border trade, especially with countries like India and Myanmar, uh, even the Thais and Viets. And so with those, with those numbers not being specifically published, so to speak, uh, it's always been a wild card to the point where USDA about a year ago actually began extracting the Chinese in their global demand, uh, supply and demand estimates. So you had the world and then the world without China, which gave us a little bit clearer picture. The point being that these are the big fellas out there uh, and whatever they do is going to impact all of us in one way or another. The next one in the room is India and Dr. Dr. Fisher covered this very uh, in depth so I won't spend a whole lot of time on it except to say that they do have 30 million tons of rice sitting there. Now they have frozen exports as a result of the coronavirus and the, the GSP which we've had a very in-depth look at uh, the loss of that status, but at the end of the day, there's still 30 million tons of rice sitting there waiting to go somewhere when the world decides to open back up. And that's the, it's an elephant in the room that can't be ignored uh, with the, that has taken some of the pressure off of the other Asian suppliers in that the traditional Indian customers are being supplied from other sources. However, once India comes back in the market, that is going to be a, a pretty big supply side it. Um, under the GSP, again, uh, they are hugely subsidizing their growers up to eight times more than what they're allowed to under the WTO. Um, as Dr. Fisher mentioned, the U.S. rice industry, uh, USA Rice, as well as the U.S. Rice Producers Association have been active in trying to uh, level the playing field, um, working with USTR, uh, and I think it's a good example of ways that the industry can come together as a whole and uh, and get stuff done. So this this is something that's gotten everybody's attention, and we are moving forward with that. Um, more close to home, and this is where we get into more of the meat and potatoes, uh, is Mexico and Central America. Now we've recently started the implementation of the USMCA. Uh, it's had a lot of implications for manufacturing and other sectors of the economy, but for agriculture and rice specifically, it's we're more in the business as usual. Um, which is a good thing. We're uh, first do no harm, and that uh, seems to be, have been the case with rice. We've seen uh, a lot of volume, a lot of buying interest uh, going to those that, to Latin America, um, and that's, that's been beneficial for us, especially through the last few months uh, with this unusual times that we have. U.S. market share, uh, we have maintained volume in Mexico. So from a ton by ton, year by year basis, we've been pretty uh, consistent. But uh, we have been losing some market share. It's been eroding to uh, South America, other com uh, competing rough rice markets. And uh, we can't forget about the Asian access via the TPP. Uh, that's a big concern both in the United States and in Mexico. Uh, the millers in Mexico do not want to see Asian milled rice coming in. It cuts into their margins. Obviously, we do not want to lose a major trading partner. And so that's, that's something we've kind of kept an eye on. There's very little that we can do about it at this point in time, except maintain vigilance and try to be as competitive as we can in those markets. Something that has really uh, 
change the change the game, if you will, especially here in Texas, is the ability and the uh, the new avenues that we have to trade with Mexico. Uh, several years ago, um, we were pretty much a domestic-based market. Uh, the market changed. The, the factors changed. We now have the ability to load vessels out of Port Houston. We've been able, successful at doing cross-border trade via trucks. Um, and that's really revitalized both the Texas and the South Louisiana markets and rice industries. And so we're really excited about that and trying to maintain those market shares. Um, and there is arguably a potential we may be able to increase the health and, and volume of the Texas market as we progress through the years. Central America is another area that, uh, I mean, they're between Mexico and Central America, they're our biggest uh, trading partners for rice. Um, they, Central America is a much more quality-based uh, market. They look at the the real high quality, we call them package quality hybrids, uh, your 153, Presidio, Chenier's, uh, the, the top of the top, they're, they're very quality conscious. And we have done, we as an industry, I, I say that, have done a really good job of getting the quality requirements that the buyers present to us met. Uh, we've had a very good uh, track record of fulfilling their orders. And so that is another uh, avenue that the market can go towards um, especially for those that those areas that are able to IP, that's not just Texas anymore. Uh, and so, serving Central America, trying to build some market share there is a big uh, is a big push. It's something we should be focusing on as well. Due to geography, uh, Central America has a much greater ability to look at the Mercosur markets, uh, Brazil, um, South of Argentina, Uruguay, Paraguay, and they have. Uh, they're very competitive on price in that region. And so while it's a quality market, it's also a very price driven market. And the, the ability of Mercosur to service that market is uh, something we have to watch as well. Uh, very often we find ourselves outpriced, whether it's an exchange rate issue or simply a, uh, a supply and demand issue, but um, we're, we're making inroads, but a little bit more slowly. One of the issues with Mercosur is the reliability. Uh, the infrastructure there to load and ship rice is not what we have in the United States. Uh, and so the opportunities for the Mercosur uh, regions to move into to Central America is more of a hit and miss. It's, it's very day to day, week to week, as opposed to consistent, which is a good thing for US origin. Um, much like Mexico, we have we now have the ability across the South to reach into Central America, again, through the ports of Houston and Lake Charles. Uh, a lot of the guys on the east side have been very successful at, at uh, working with the, the Port of Lake Charles to, to get their rice into these markets. And so uh, from our standpoint uh, as marketers, any the, the, more the more opportunities we have in the market, the better. So this is another one of those really good things. So moving into the, I guess the balance sheet, when we're working off of the June supply and demand, uh, which a lot happened in June, uh, I would like to remark as well that tomorrow we're gonna see the July uh, um, balance sheet come out as well, supply and demand estimates. So that's gonna change some of these numbers, but with everything that happened in June, we're gonna see some, uh, a major, an increase in acreage that was kind of writing on the wall. We knew that was coming. And if I were to speculate, I'd say tomorrow we'll probably have about 90,000 acres in total added to, uh, to the total harvest, uh, I'm sorry, total planted area. Harvested area is going to be the big one. Uh, the upper Delta, Northeast Arkansas, South Missouri, uh, Mississippi as well have had a lot of uh, weather issues over the course of the year. It's impacted planting, it's impl impacted uh, crop development, uh, they've got crops or some fields over in that part of the world, I'm told, that are some of them are already at flood and a few of them just got planted. So they're really spread out. When you see these types of uh, planting and production anomalies, you tend to see a decrease in yield. Uh, and when, when, especially when it relates to Arkansas, which is the largest rice producing state, I think it's possible we'll see a yield dec decrease in tomorrow's report. Now that's, again, anybody's guess. Import numbers have been steadily on the rise over the last several years, especially in the last few months, even with the loss of GSP uh, imports, uh, for India at least, 
imports have really gained ground in the United States. Uh, this is due to uh, cultural preferences. This is due to uh, specific demand for your jasmine, or, uh, basmati, your fragrant rices. But at the end of the day, that does increase the total supply number. Um, on the demand side, exports have been flagging the past few weeks. One argument is that we've pretty well sold out of rice anyway, so it's not a surprise. The other counter argument to that is that the U.S. is still priced out of the market and in a much more competitive market, uh, buyers are looking at other sources. So while the argument exists that exports for the year will be decreased again, uh, and I wouldn't be surprised to see that, um, I would expect to see that number come back up in the fall after new crop gets online. That'll be when we really know whether or not exports are gonna be impacted for the whole year. Domestic consumption has been fairly flat for a, for a while now, uh, so that's not a big surprise. And when you take the net impacts of the supply side down to the demand side, uh, we're going to see bigger ending stocks. That's just the, the way it's going to be. Um, domestically, we have seen some anomalies this year, though. When coronavirus hit, there was a huge run on purchasing uh, of all of the commodities, not just in rice, but rice saw it specifically. Um, and there's a ongoing debate whether or not we have actually seen a shift in demand. Um, again, one argument suggests that people panic bought, uh, be, your, your average household that might consume five pounds of rice a year, saw rice on the shelf, put a 25 pound bag rice in the cart, and it's just gonna sit there. So we've satiated demand for a period of time. The other counter argument to that would be that the force to eat at home has increased consumption to a, to a minor extent domestically. Um, and so we, we may see some demand perk up following new crop and coronavirus as well. Uh, again, that has yet to be determined. That's more of a long-term speculation, but it's something to be aware of. Everybody I'm certain has noticed the processing interruptions and the resulting uh, prices on the store at least of beef and, and meat and other goods like that that don't reflect themselves at the farm level um, until these the these shocks sort themselves out then there's going to be a lot of volatility in all of the markets just from the producer all the way to the plate um, it's it's going to need to sort itself out there's been a lot of discussion about the futures market as well specifically the july contract I know Dr. Outlaw had noted that it, it was very high in comparison to its, uh, its new crop uh, counterparts. And there's several reasons for this, and in my opinion at least. Um, the, the July contract saw a lot of things we haven't seen before, specifically deliveries. It's very rare for uh, a per, a, an entity, a, a commercial aspect, to take a position in the futures market and hold it all the way through to delivery. So they take physical uh, control of the underlying commodity at the expiration. Uh, that almost never happens in rice until this year. We've seen a, a very large spike in deliveries against the July contract. Um, it's my opinion that there were some, in some major entities out there that got caught uh, out of position and they, they defended their short position and were able to hold the funds and the specs out so that the market had to run up for them to get out. I mean, we saw as much as an eight or nine dollar spread at one point when the traditional spread would be max two to two dollars and fifty cents. So that's been a, a real a quirk uh, that we've been watching. Uh, it seems to have kind of settled itself out. I know July is exiting the board imminently uh, and it closed or it was up this morning at 19 but it had been converging with the, uh, with the new crop market. Some of that also is a reflection of the increased demand uh, for, for both domestic and overseas buyers uh, looking for early uh, rice deliveries before new crop got off. So you can't discount that either. The um, old crop has pretty well gone. Um, there's very few elevators or commercial dryers in Texas that have any rice in them, which is a good thing. We're starting the year off at zero, so we've had a chance to clean out, blow out, uh, fumigate, get everything ready for new crop. And 
we're working against the concept called pipeline venom, which essentially suggests that there's always going to be some rice between the, the between the producer and the final user. Somewhere there is a little bit of rice yet to be had. Uh, there's a big debate as to what the actual pipeline minimum is, but I think this year we can say we've gotten down to it given the demand and uh, demand factors and price factors that we've seen in the futures and the cash markets over the last several weeks. Um, what does all this mean for Texas? We're going to definitely have a higher acreage from 2019, uh, probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 190, 180,000 acres, which is up from 153,000 for the June 30 report. So about 30,000 more acres spread between um, the commercial varieties. The excuse me. There's always a bit of seed rice. There's a bit of uh, organic that factors into these numbers as well. But I think the majority of the gains have been uh, been gleaned from the commercial varieties. We're having a, a really, really good year so far. Uh, all the farmers were able to get in the fields early. We're able to plant on time. I mean, field work has gone like clockwork for the first time in probably a decade. Uh, talking with multiple crop consultants, the, the common denominator is that this is the best crop we've seen in, in since the 80s. I, I had one gentleman tell me that. And so that's, you know, we're looking at strong yields, good quality. We're going to be one of the first ones off. Uh, fields have already been drained. We should see combines in the field as early as next week. And so we're off to a really good start. Uh, to add a little bit of good news to the conversation, um, we have a, a pretty good demand uh, structure right now, the, especially with the export market, um, Mexico and Central America through trucks and vessels to Mexico and potentially a vessel to Central America is on the table. Nothing has yet been done, but simply having the opportunity to do this gives us the ability to begin the marketing year in a better place uh, to, to work forward. Ideally, if we can move uh, five or 500, 600,000 hundred weights out of the state, somewhere between first and second crop, give the elevators a chance to make some space and, and get it on down the road. That would really help out from a marketing standpoint. Um, again, there's very little old crop left. I'm not aware of, of more than a handful in the state, and most of that are uh, lots that have stain or they were just a, a leftover lot, sweepings, things like that but there's nothing out there. And so that gives us the opportunity to start off with a clean slate and work our, our major buyers and, and get something done. And so our new crop expectations from, I guess here's the, the short version. Um, I don't see a whole lot of harvest pressure coming down. Uh, we've got a lot of buyers out there. We've talked about that. Uh, they need to cover up. They've been aggressively looking for the first shipments and have been bidding for the first rice that comes off. Texas is in an, in, an enviable position in that we will be the first crop available for shipment. Uh, we'll be the first with dry lots online to get it out to these buyers. And a lot of these buyers have forward contracts. Uh, given the environmental factors that we've seen this year, I don't see a lot of quality issues. And I think with our volume, uh, we, we should be uh, excuse me, we should be able to fulfill some of these this need. For pricing, and this is always the question that, that comes up, uh, at harvest, we have seen some stuff trading at about a 675 premium. Again, the new crop loan value is 708 for this year, basis 5570. Um, that 675 is for early shipment, so that would be for July, August, SEP. Uh, for second, late, second crop or later season, you're probably looking between 6 and 675. Uh, that price will come down as buyers are able to access the upper river markets, again, depending on quality. But uh, they'll have a broader spectrum, a bigger catalog to look through and, uh, and be able to price shop a little bit more aggressively. Late, late season, so December, November, December into 21, a lot's going to depend on what volume and quality comes out of that upper delta region, Arkansas, Mississippi, Missouri. Um, if they have quality problems, then we could be on the $7 premium side of the spectrum, 675. However, if they are able to pull this off and come out with uh, strong yields and, mar and at least acceptable quality, then we could probably see premiums back off into that $5 range. Uh, for the year. So 
for Texas growers, you're looking at 13, between 13 and $14 for the year, which is better than we've seen in years past. And so on balance, I'm fairly excited about this crop year. I think we're gonna be in a pretty good place. So with that, I'm gonna wrap it up and open it for questions. Uh, thank y'all for letting me talk and for listening to me. And if there's anything we can do, please don't hesitate to ask. So Dr. Wynn, thank you. Thank you very much and for a good thorough presentation. Um, thank you to um, all the other presenters and their time and, and to our participants. Um, we couldn't do this without an audience, so thank you. And uh, we will be in contact with you uh, with the survey and please feel free to reach out to us uh, if you need anything whatsoever. To, uh, and like Dr. Hale was saying, best way to reach us is through your local county extension office. And uh, we'd be glad to, to help you. Uh, so team, is there anything else y'all would like to add before we close out this morning? Uh, Corey, uh, yes. possibly today, we'll complete the editing of the research highlights which is a 44 page summary of, of all major aspects of research at Eagle Lake and Beaumont. Uh, I'll send you a copy once that's done. And if you could distribute that to your list and I'll distribute it uh, to my list, it'll uh, go into greater detail in terms of the aspects of research that, that I touched on in my presentation. Okay. And in your website, uh, Dr. Wilson is? Uh, Beaumont.tamu.edu. And for those who want crop survey data, uh, weather data from across the globe, uh, they're available by drop down menus. Go all the way to the right, and the last two tabs near the top are the ones you want to click. eLibrary contains old copies of rice production guidelines and uh, the uh, research highlights and Texas rice and uh, the applications that they can access uh, through our website. All right, so with that, we wish all of our producers a uh, safe and productive harvest. And uh, thank you again for joining us today. Y'all stay safe.